finish there, John. Thank you. Brilliant. Let's take a seat, shall we? How are we doing today, everybody? We okay? Is the life out there? Wonderful. Do you know, I really appreciated it when we first came into church today. And there was sun coming in through there and everybody seemed relaxed. If you've got problems and cares in the world, you were pretending they didn't exist. to presence yourself amongst us in the power of your spirit and point us to our hope in Jesus. Uh, Lord, would you give us a humble heart? Would you give us a returning heart? Would you give us a desire to press into you, to know you, to enjoy you, to serve you, to honor you? Please, Lord, come and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, listen, we're marching through this book of Hosea. Uh, it's 750 BC, or maybe a little bit, maybe 740 BC. And the Lord is dealing with the nation of Israel. And we're going to get right to the nub of the issue. All their trouble started here. We're going to see where all their trouble started. And as we see that, we're going to see where all of our trouble starts. Spiritually... And of course, spiritually is the fount of everything that happens within us. Spiritually, this is the place where the trouble always starts. And I don't want to freak anybody out or worry you, but as we look at it, it's going to be incredibly close to home. We're going to get something of a little warning going on here. This is the thing, this is where the trouble starts, where you get robbed of joy, where you find yourself flirting with other loves, where you find yourself beginning to be indifferent to serving the Lord. It is the base place where everybody starts uh, before they know the Lord. So if you're somebody here who does not yet know the love of God in your life because you haven't welcomed him in, you, you already are here. And I'm hoping you don't stay here as a result of this. Uh, where is it that all the trouble starts? Answer, having a limp, lame, and shallow sense of God's love. That's where all the trouble starts. Spiritually, every struggle that you face in your life can be sourced back to that. Having a limp, lame, and shallow sense of the love of God. And we've got to this book, in the, uh, this chapter in the book of Hosea, where it's like he's laying it on the line, and it's God speaking all the way through. And the whole point of it is so they would get a sense as to what they've walked out on, what they turned away from, what they determined wasn't as big, wasn't as important as it should have been, the love of God, the privilege that they'd experienced, the grace that had entered in, the, the, the wealth that was available to them on tap, moment by moment. Does that even sound good in your ears as you hear it? It should do, shouldn't it? That there is a God of love, but the problem is, and this is hard for me, and this will be hard for you, you're hiding behind a veil, and, and your heart tends towards believing that the Lord's love is limp, lame, and shallow. That's what I'm battling against as I try to open up God's word to my own soul. Oh, it's not really, you know, it's limp, it's lame, it's shallow. I wouldn't use those words. It just feels distant. It doesn't feel wholesome and, uh, and weighty. And as we look into this, we're going to see ways in which the Lord's love is the very opposite of limp, lame, and shallow. And can I tell you that as you press into that, and even be praying as you're listening to this, saying, Lord, help me to see this, help me to sense this, help me to be captured by this again. You, as you see this and sense this, you move further and further away from a place of trouble. Do you see that? 
So, listen, the, the passage breaks down into four very easy bits. Uh, the first bit is verses 1 through to 4, and it's the tender Father's love of God. Anthony's been referencing that as we've been speaking. Um, uh, we're going to see this together. I wonder whether somebody would be willing to read for us nice and boldly and loudly verses 1 through to 4. And as, you, as you're hearing it read... This is, if you like, the family album being pulled out. This is the past. This is, this is the family history of the tender father's love towards this nation of Israel. And then we'll figure out how that applies to us. This is in the past. This is the story. What would be on the picture postcards? Okay. What would be there um, on, on, on the revolving pictures that are up on the iPad on the, on the shelf? Okay. Somebody read verses 1 through to 4 nice and loudly for us, please. Brilliant. Now, the people say, if you forget where you come from, you'll forget who you are. And this is the picture of where they've come from. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the story, the nation of Israel, it started around about 2000 BC when the Lord called to a guy called Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm sending you over there because uh, from your family out of all the nations of the world, I'm going to make you a little bit of a, a showcase, like a show home of what it means to be restored and related to the true and living God. I'm going to give you a blessing. I'm going to be present with you. I'm going to give you a land. And the nations will look in and see what it means to be related to the true living God, the creator and sustainer of the whole world. And Abraham scratched his head and he scratched his butt and he said, all right, not knowing the journey and the adventure that they would go on. And his family moves across to the area where we now know as Israel. And then he has sons, and then they have sons, and then there's the big drama where they get taken down into Egypt, and it looks as if God's promises to them are dead. But then Lord comes along, and he, he draws them out of Egypt, and he binds them to himself. And the picture book would simply be of the marriage photos up on Mount Sinai, where he gives them the Ten Commandments, and they, he says, I will be your God, and they say, we will be your people, and they're wedded together. And it's looking like they've got a wonderful future ahead of them, until the second that that infant nation, under the care of this, this father and husband image together, decides to play the field, Despi decides to kick off and think they know better. They've been nurtured, they've been rescued, they've been wed, they've been, he's spoken to them in love and grace, and you get picked the sense of why. Look at verse um, uh, look at verse 1 and 2. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, you get that word that came up twice, called? It's this idea of beckoning somebody to yourself. A choice, a free choice that is made. The Lord freely chose to set his love on this people. It wasn't because they were any good. It wasn't because they were more holy. It wasn't because they had more potential. It wasn't because they were more mighty. The Lord just decides to set his love upon somebody. So I take you back nearly 18 years, and um, Jane and I got married. And probably for about the first five years, it cut me deep, this did. The first five years we were married... Somebody had uh, somebody asked Jane and say, so why did you marry Stee? It seems a little bit odd. <laughs> why would you marry Stee? And the answer that she gave was so romantic. It was, he would have me. Gutted. So basically what that says about us when we come to us getting married was she was desperate and I was gullible. Okay. I just wanted somebody who would have me, and I was stupid enough to fall for it, okay? Um, but if you ask her now, why am I still married to Stee? And if I was allowed to answer that for her, it would be because my wife has committed herself to love me, even though she knows the worst about me. That's, the re that's pretty much the reason we're still married, isn't it? 
she has decided now that she will actually start to, although she said those vows, you know, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and all that, she didn't mean it when she said it. And as a pastor, I can tell you, when people get married, they don't really mean it. Well, they sort of do, but they don't know what they're getting into. What they basically mean is, you're offering me everything that I really want, or at least I've kidded myself into believing you're everything I really want, and I'm going to be happy being married to you. And then gradually, over a period of time, it moves towards going through the phase of realising what a, a scumbag you're married to, how useless they are, and how they won't deliver on your dreams. Uh, you see, I've been a pastor for a, for a little while, you know, really positive outlook on marriage. And moving to a point of just utter surrender where you go, oh well, I best do what God says, which is love that person for their good as he loves me. That's the transition that happens in married life. You see, the Lord started out knowing he was the only one to go into a wedding vow without sort of rosy eyes. He knew that they were going to be useless. Um, they were going to be, uh, show infidelity. They were going to be delinquent. But he said, I called you. Look at the tenderness here that we get in these verses. Uh, verse 3, it was I who taught Ephraim, that's another name for the nation of Israel, to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not uh, realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of ki human kindness, with ties of love. They were blind to how much they had been, how much they had received in promises and grace. But they didn't want to know. It was like a, a little toddler, you know, a toddler who's now grown up to a teenager, and the toddler has forgotten, or, or, or the teenager has forgotten, or just won't see, or can't see how they'd been held, how they'd been taught, how they'd been loved, how they'd been fed, how they'd been cared for, how they'd had all their messes cleaned up for them, how much, how much that loving parent had, had sacrificed and gone without so that the child could be blessed. That's the tender father's love of God. And that's why their rebellion in verse 2 is all the more reprehensible. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. That is the natural rebellion of the human heart against the love of the true and living God. That's why it's so hard for us to, to keep right bubbling in front of our eyes anything other than the fact that the Lord's, well, that, that, that it, it's so hard for us to understand, and what am I trying to say? We so quickly slip into believing that the Lord's love is lame, limp, and shallow. It's just where our human hearts go. We almost want to believe that it's not enough. And I think this is a really painful image here. We're supposed to get a sense of a loved child, called, privileged, who says, sling your hook, mum and dad, I know better. And I thought about trying to illustrate that, but the, the, that's something to get the, the sourness and the sense of betrayal that you can, I can't really illustrate it, you have to experience it. And here, right in the middle of the book of Hosea, the Lord is saying, this is something that I live with on a day-by-day -day basis. An unfaithful child. Some of you know the anguish of being the parent of a fool. And it's horrible. And yet he loved them. Yet he loved them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. And I bent down to feed them. That is the love of God. Can I tell you that nobody has loved you like the true and living God? Nobody has. Do you believe that? He doesn't... I used to think this would, would be difficult. I, in fact, I, I had a conversation with Jane about it when we, when, when we were about to have Becky, who's our second eldest daughter. I was like, I, how can I... All my love goes to Bethany, the eldest... How can, I, how, how can I find love for another? And then she comes along and it's like the love doubled. And then I had another four on top of that. And it's like, I, where did that extra love come from? You're one in seven billion. Don't you dare think that the Lord hasn't got enough love for you. It's not difficult because of who he is. He loves like that. 
He has loved you by creation. He's made you and you're precious and unique in his sight. He's, he's loved you by invitation. By virtue of the fact you are here today, whether you've trusted in him and surrendered your life to him or not, he has ex- extended the greatest of privileges and calls to you to know him personally. And some of you have taken that up, so you know him by salvation. You know, so often we will try to measure God's love by our circumstance or our feelings, both of which are not insignificant, but they are very, very, very poor measures of our ability. Well, our, our ability to see is wonky. Don't you dare try to measure the Lord's love by your feelings or your circumstance. That is foolish. You measure it by his faithfulness. And he has never, for so much as a second, been unfaithful to you ever irrespective of how you've behaved towards him he has loved you with faithfulness and where the trouble starts is when we get God wrong and we start to think that his love is lame limp and shallow that's why Hosea 11 is here so that you and I as we read over their mistakes would not make that same mistake we would press hard every day into saying no the love of God is rich and abounding and tender and fatherly and of more worth than gold Lord I want to take my stand on it today whatever I'm facing whatever's coming at me he is God and not a man he loves with this faithfulness so there's the tender tender father's love What about verses 5 through to 7? If the tender father's love was seen in the past in the way that he had treated uh, his precious loved nation of Israel, now we're into the present. And they're basically at the end of the road. They've gone into full-blown meltdown. They have left the father's house. They have declared without any shadow of a doubt, I don't want you to be my father anymore. And so this is how the Lord responds. And what does he do? He responds with a righteous and holy love. A righteous and holy love. And we need to see this. Uh, Otherwise, we'll we'll always view his love as limp, lame, and shallow. So somebody read for us verses 5 through to 7. Verses 5 through to 7. See it in the present. This is what is playing out in round about the, the year 740 BC. Somebody read that for us, please. Now, these are really tragic verses because this has come, you know, it's, it's, it's six, seven hundred years after he had, he, he had bound them to himself and they were called to be his. And all the time, if he had, he had put, put the brakes on their waywardness and he had put reins upon their, um, their desire to be like all the other nations and to be less than they were made to be, um, this is at the point where they're straining on the reins and they're desperate to go back and be like the other nations around They look and they see the fool's goals of Egypt and Assyria, and they think, we want to be like them, which is balmy, really. Um, (laughs) uh, Sometimes, uh, maybe every two or three weeks, what we get on the news is a report of a lady or a fella who, for some reason, um, something happened in their life that moved them on the step to being radicalised, and it's only a matter of months before they've sold up home in the UK and they've moved to go and join the war effort in support of ISIL, ISIS in the Middle East. And our secular newspapers are all up, up in arms. Why would they do this? Why would they, why would they want to go and be part of a regime and a nation and an established government that is so cruel, violent, oppressive and dehumanising? And it seems utterly mental to us, doesn't it? We look at it in the papers, and we're like, why have they done that? And we were even trying to enact laws that stop parents taking their kids to be able to do that because there's a duty of care to stop people doing something that is just as mental as that. That's exactly what Israel were like. If you knew Assyria, the closest modern equivalent to Assyria back in 700, uh, 740 BC, in the modern age, is ISIS. They were cruel, they were oppressive. They were violent. If you were to look at some of their religious practices, they were, they were closer to a horror film. Um, I don't want to list them all because you won't get the images out of your mind, but they were utterly horrible. 
It was a mixture of something like Saw 5 and some post-apocalyptic movie that comes along every now and again, like, like Mad Max. It was utterly depraved. And they're like, we want to be like a Sirius. Sign us up. This is great. So in the present, as they pull away from the Lord, you go from the place of blessing and safety and love and dignity and the rule of law. The only place to go is Assyria. And they're charging headlong into it. There would be no freedom, no choice, little ownership, no rule of law. That's hell. And that's what they're choosing. And here, the Lord, in justice and in dignity, is saying, I will allow you to have what you want. Will they not return to Egypt? Will not, uh, will not Assyria rule over them? Because they refuse to repent. A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. They're... They're headed for disaster, and they're rubbing their hands with glee as they go. They wanted this. They asked for it. He asked for them. Turn. But they're planning for it. They're going with glee. They're bent on it. They're determined. It seems right for them to try and build a life of their own imagining without the Lord. Does that sound familiar? And they're really convinced that it won't end badly. They are choosing hell with a smile on their face. And the righteous, holy love of God gives people what they want. Their betrayal of him and their own foolishness plays out with utter dignity on his part. He only gives them what they want. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say you only go to hell because you want to. We are stupid. We don't want him. How messed up are we that we would choose evil and self-determination over this loving Heavenly Father? But we do. He has called to them, return, return, return. No blessing, no purpose, no focus. Come, be one of my people. It's the same appeal that the Lord Jesus put out again and again and again. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would love to gather you in, but you would not have it. So the point comes where they're handed over to their choices. It's pretty sad there in verse 7, isn't it? This is, how, this is how bad it's got, verse 7. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. What does that mean? They're crying, Lord, get us out of the jam. Help us when they should be crying. Lord, we just want you. We surrender to you. We've been fools. They want a genie who gets them out of their jams. They don't want a sovereign Lord who loves them. And that's where the trouble starts. How severe a thing it is to turn away from the Lord because he is righteous and holy in his love. He gives us dignity and he is God and not a man. He can do that without ever doing wrong. He can do it even doing right as he does it because he is God and not a man. So one of the things that we can miss and, and, and create a, a lame, limp, shallow version of God's love is one where there aren't severe consequences for turning away from him. Now, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you there because it's there in the Bible, and history records it happened. If you want to know how seriously the Lord takes sin, just look at the cross. Do you think Jesus would have died there on that cross to carry the weight of sin if there was any other way for us to have a future. No, his holy, righteous love is not to be messed with. Don't have a lame, limp, shallow view of the love of God. But then we move on. If that was for, we've seen the, the past of the nation of Israel, their present, it was just working out. Assyria was at the gate and the Lord was allowing that to happen. What about the long-term promises? What about their future? What about... Does he just wash his hands of this nation of people who just re, re, uh, continually are running away like the rebellious child in the, in the story of the prodigal son? Well, we need to see here a relentless divine love, verses 8 and 9. A relentless divine love. Somebody read for us verses 8 and 9. Who's going to do that for us? Go for it.
Brilliant. Thank you for reading that. The relentless divine love of the Lord. And this is what, what, almost a unique um, section of, of the Bible. Very rarely do we see this, where the Lord lets his heart be seen. And he lets loose. How can I give you up, Ephraim? If you've ever been offended by a child, you'll know that sense. On the one hand, you want to rip their throat out. On the other hand, you just want to cuddle them. You don't know whether to kill them or cuddle them. And it's a turmoil. In fact, that's what that word is, is there. My heart is changed within me. Uh, in, verse, in verse 8, my heart is changed within me. It literally means turmoil or um, uh, an overturning or turned over. He has got this... How can I, how, how, how can I, I can't give you up. You see, I looked at this, because I'm, I'm just a man, and I looked at this and say, how can you not, how can you not um, give them up? How can you not hand them over? How can you not treat them like Adma? And what Adma was a, a fabled city. It was almost like a byword for being totally destroyed and never remembered and having no future again. If you want to go and find out more about that, look in Genesis 19 around the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Adma and Zeboim there, they're sort of like bywords for totally destroyed, no future, done with, buried. And I'm like, well, how can you not do this to this nation, Lord? Think about how they've betrayed you. Think about how they've, they've belittled you and defied you. You're the living God. And they've shaken their puny fists and they've said, we know better than you. We'll take everything good from you and we hate you. How can you not do that to them? And the Lord there, he's like, how can, I, how can I give you up? How can I do this? I was trying to think of an illustration for this. And I really want to be really careful with this, but this was the closest one I could get to in terms of how offensive this idea here is. There have been terrible scenes in Nice this week, haven't there? Where that monster plowed his truck through the crowd of people, at least ten of the dead are little children who'd just gone out that evening for... Absolutely horrendous. And imagine that one of those ten children, and it might be the case for all I know, was the mayor of that town. So here is this, this villainous man who's driven in, slaughtered men, women, and children, one of whom is the, is the child of the mayor, an attack against the city that he represents. And imagine that the, the guy who's done this hasn't been killed, but he's been captured, he's been brought into custody... And the mayor, on the one hand, knows what, this, he, what has been done to him and his city. But while everybody in the media is gunning for blood, the mayor is standing there going, we've got to find a way for this guy to have a future. Even what he's done to me and to our people, we've got to find a way for this guy to have a future. How can we give him up? How can we hand him over? How can, we, how can we treat him as one who's dead and buried? It's ludicrous, isn't it? And who is it who's speaking like this? The true and living God. I get so upset when people think they're more compassionate and gracious and merciful and forgiving than God. Sometimes when something bad happens to you, how dare you? People think they're more generous than God. In fact, it's emphatic here. For I am God and not a man. Our mercy, our grace, our forgiveness, our compassion is fickle and we'll cast it irresponsibly on things. And we'll do it with a swagger. That's what man is like. Here is one who, if you want to know God... You know him on a, a level that is above anything that you'll ever experience on planet Earth. In his gracious, relentless, divine love to the undeserving. Do you see that? So here's the question all the way through. How can I give them up? How can I not give them up? How can I give them up? How can I not give them up? And that's the, 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 those are the two big questions that trundle all the way through the Old Testament of the Bible, the first two thirds of the Bible. You've got this sense of... The compassionate love of God, desperate to save sinners. And then his righteous love, that is right to hand people over to their own wickedness and give them the consequence. To hand them over to destruction.
gave us his son to yield his life and atonement for sin. Andy, 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 hold off a second. We've got audio visual problems, and this is too good a song for us to not sing well. Can we see whether the computer's going to spring into. Anthony, have you got a password, mate? Honestly. This is too good a song for us to miss. It's worth the wait. Sure. Uh. Man United. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> Andy, thank you. Okay. To God be the glory, great things we have done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. All come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He have done. Oh, a perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes The moment from Jesus the pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh come to the Father through Jesus the Son I give as you were listening to God's word open there, you got a sense that you want to escape that place of trouble, that place where in your life the Lord is seen and sensed as his love is seen and sensed as a limp, lame and shallow thing. If you've seen something that is wholesome in his love now, we have a moment just to pray and praise him and ask that we'd hold on to that and ask that that would reshape us, and ask that that would be effective in our lives as we seek to follow after him. So maybe a few of you just want to lead us in prayer, praising him for aspects of his love that you've seen afresh today, and you want to lay hold of, lest you go to that place of trouble or stay there. Uh, Maybe two or three people, four or five, however many, want to lead us in prayer, and then I'll close in a second. Somebody start us off, please.